This is Distant Replay. Time for another documentary recap here on Distant Replay. It's Brett Favre of Football Life from 2016. It's one of the the, the series. We've kind of gone through this one before, Barry Sanders, but a series that looks at different players, Hall of Fame players, and goes back through their life and kind of cap, tries to capture it in a, you know within an hour. Uh, some of the highlights. So today we get Brett Favre, the former Green Bay Packer, one of the greats of all time, and it was interesting to go back and watch the story on him. So we'll discuss that today, some takeaways we had from this documentary on the show. Welcome in, Mike. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well, man. And Ben, you know what surprised me about this was I, there's no rhyme or reason like what football life episodes they did first, you know? Because yeah. you think Brett Favre, like what took till 2016 for them to do Brett Favre, you know? This is a series that this is a series for five, six, seven years at this point. Yeah, no idea. Good question. Yeah, but it was it was a good one though. I actually you think you know everything about Brett Favre, but but this opened my eyes to some stuff I didn't know. Yeah, you always learn something. I mean, we we know the overall the big picture stuff, but yeah, you get into a little bit of uh, the backstory, the family life is always a big part of these stories, and we get all that today. So if you haven't joined us, distantreplaypodcast.com is our website. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can find all of our stuff there. So let's get into this one again. This is from 2016, so not that old. It felt it felt older, <laughs> to be honest with you. But it captures Brett back in Mississippi, where he lives now, kind of working on the farm, staying busy. He's very much an everyman. I think that's kind of the the common thread here. Yeah, the common what they wanted to hit home in this with Brett Favre is he's an everyman. Was really close to his father, and he was a warrior on the football field. Yeah, that's those. That's kind of like the cliff notes of what we're going to go over here today. And it kind of all started for him in Kiln, Mississippi, uh, where he grew up in in the kind of house where his parents basically put it like, "We want to have everything at this house, so we never need to leave." You know, so so people can come here and have a good time. They threw parties. Very social family. His dad was his high school football coach. Seemed like a very old school kind of guy. And I, this quote sort of really stuck out to me in regards to that. His dad, whose name was Irv, said, when you get hurt, crawl off the field. When I see you can't crawl, I'll come get you. So mm-hmm. I think we get a little bit of an insight into how Brett Favre, his mentality later as a player, just by that quote by his dad. Yeah, I think that kind of sets it up. And I think that's what a lot of coaches um, who have kid, like sons that play, especially, I don't know if maybe as much as you were, but like back in those days, I mean, I think that was pretty common, like, Look, are you injured or are you hurt? Right, that's kind of always been the discussion, right? If you're if you're injured, okay, we'll come help you out. But if you're just hurt, let's we'll get up and and and, and work through it. Um, and that's kind of the mentality he always had. And he always kind of had that at the back of his mind too. His dad once said, and he said this during his Hall of Fame speech, that you know he, his dad was talking to his coaches, right? I think he was, and um, maybe college. I don't remember what it was, but said he's going to redeem himself. Like Brad will always redeem himself. And he said he played his whole career trying to redeem himself and just, and just kind of live up to that potential and what the expectations were for him. Um, that was kind of the backbone to, to everything he did throughout his career. Yeah, it seemed like his, his template for his career from what he's outlined in his Hall of Fame speech was trying to live up to his dad's expectations and try to exceed them. You know, mm-hmm. Not only like what his dad wanted to do on the football field, but how he wanted to live his life as a man. You know? Yeah, and, and his dad ran the wishbone offense in high school. As he yeah. coached, how about that? He loved yeah. he loved being the lead blocker in the wishbone. Yeah, maybe the greatest, maybe the best arm like talent, one of the best arm talents in <laughs> NFL history was in a wishbone coordinated by his father. You calling Irv a bad coach? No, I'm calling <laughs> Irv. This is the, what I mean. It's like you know, Irv's not even changing his offense for his son who has a good arm. You know? Yeah, he, st- he sticks to his system. Exactly. Um, he did get an offer to go play at Southern Miss, which is not very far away from where he lived. Um, I think everybody kind of remembers him there or knows of that that career. But what I didn't know is that he was in a big car accident when he was in college, so much so that he had he went in and like literally, I mean, a life threatening injury and had a ton of stitches. Was in the uh, the hospital for some time, so much so that he lost thirty six pounds in the hospital. And uh, this was like, I guess this was dur- was it during the season, Mike? Very beginning of the season. Yeah, so basically with it, with it, the way they outlined it was he gets in a car accident, has 30 inches of his small intestine removed, <sighs> loses 36 pounds, misses, you know, almost all of preseason, comes back the second game of the regular season versus your Alabama Crimson Tide and beats them. So that's like his signature win as a college quarterback and gets him on the radar of pro scouts. Um, did You don't remember that game at all, obviously, right? Uh, I I don't remember watching it, but I, I know of it. 
Okay. So it's one of those ones where it's like, oh, Brett Favre beat the Crimson Tide. Yeah. It's talked about a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that that wreck happened in July of, of, of 1990, um, just not too far from his parents' house. But, yeah, so he came back and, and, and then led that that win and, and went on to have a really good career with with Southern Miss, and it set him up to be drafted. So this was this this draft was obviously very interesting because 1991 he went second round, 33rd pick. But of course, you had the infamous photo of him laying on his bed with his jean shorts and his hat on, and like it's surrounded by family. That one, that first of all, that picture is, is one of the greats of all time. Yeah, that's an someone someone uh, was it Baker Mayfield? Yeah, yeah. That reenacted. Not that it means the same with Baker Mayfield. I don't know, but but. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> you know, but uh, anyway, so yeah, that's an iconic picture. Um, again, him with his jean shorts on, gotta love it. And there was a time, there was a point in time, young people, where everyone wore jean shorts, no matter what anyone tells you. <laughs> it's very true, very true. Um, but the other part of this interesting that was interesting to me was he got drafted by the Falcons, right? And he was on the Falcons for a very brief time, but apparently Jerry Glanville had it out for the guy, and. You know, didn't approve of the pick apparently, and just kind of like screwed with him. Like during his time there, it wasn't there very long, but every time he had an opportunity, he kind of made fun of him. Yeah, it's kind of a weird dynamic there. But hey, really quick before I get into Jerry Glanville, do you know who was picked nine picks before Brett Favre? No. Uh, the subject of our true crime episode from Friday, Todd Marinovich. Okay. So just a little connection there between the episode we did recently. But yeah, back to Glanville. Very bizarre the way he treated Brett Favre. He he sort of treated him like a circus act. Kind of talked down to him, yeah. Yeah, like it was, and it's his second round. He's a second round pick. It's not like he was like a seventh round pick or sixth round pick. Um, I just thought it was very strange. And you know, to show you what other teams thought of Brett Favre, though, right? So he spends he's the backup in in Atlanta. He gets traded to Green Bay for a first round pick when he was a second round pick. Yeah, <laughs> which I don't know. I'm trying to think of any time I've ever heard of that happening since. Yeah, I know. When a guy hadn't played. You know, when a guy hadn't played. Yeah. You know, obviously if a guy. That's a good point. R- Ron Wolf, who's a legendary general manager, he's in large part really legendary because of how, uh, for, because of his time with the Packers, he, sta- he says in this documentary he staked his career to Brett Favre. And this is the second documentary we've had Ron Wolf in recently. We did the Elway to Marino documentary when Ron Wolf worked for the Raiders. Uh, I thought he was good in both of them, but – so Green, you know, Favre makes his way to Green Bay and is the backup there to Don Magic Man Mikowski. Wow, there you go, Magic Man. I, yeah, I was reading about about Ron Wolf and this this trade. I don't know if you knew this, but um, according to s- s- different sources in like a paper report during that time, when Favre took that physical, he was diagnosed um, with the same degenerative condition that that Bo Jackson had on his hip, and the doctors actually recommended that his physical be failed, which would have nullified the trade, but then Wolf even overruled that. I did not know Dude, that. Talk about staking your reputation. That is – that's believe. That's pounding – That's that goes <laughs> beyond pounding the table for someone like that I was talking yeah. about. I mean, that's that's like, hey, look, Ron, we all know this guy's hurt. Doctors are saying he's hurt. You still want to do this? Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. You well, know? Which also is pretty crazy that Brett's been able to play as long as he had and, went, and, and was able to take as much contact as he did through the years if that was the case. Yeah, great point. Great point. Yeah, so <laughs> he he ended up in 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 Green Bay, which is where obviously he he made his career and became a legend up there. Um, but he got his chance right away because your, your boy Magic Man, who I wasn't very familiar with, you acted like I was uh, clueless, not, not not knowing who Don Majowski was, but Mikowski, uh, Mikowski, right. exactly. That's my whole point here. Um, <laughs> but he got his chance right away. And <laughs> the best part was week like week three of the season, he gets put in. Because uh, Magic Man gets hurt, and and it's always crazy because it seems like all these great quarterbacks get an opportunity really quick, right? And they get their chance and take advantage of it right away. But um, he got a chance to get the Bengals, and he was down a touchdown with a minute left. Like it, it looked like they were starting inside their own ten, and he drummed down the field, scored a touchdown. You know, started the legend. But I was sitting there thinking, like, is this <laughs> does this speak more towards like here we go, like we get a, we get a, a glimpse of of what Brett Favre can do, or is it like? We kind of get a look at what the Bengals have been for like forever. It's like they can't they can't stop a guy in the final minute from going ninety yards against them in his first opportunity. Yeah, you think about that when you see the Bengals uniform, we're like, oh, the Bengals, poor Bengals. How many of these? How many of these that. games do they have? You know, yeah, I know. How many stars did they? How many careers started to blossom 
when they played when they played the <laughs> Bengals. You know what I mean? Um, but and could it be possible they go through in this documentary that when Favre first started as the quarterback, he wasn't really. We get into a little insight on his and, and Holmgren's relationship, um, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, but. You know, could it be possible, as they outlined in this documentary, that he did not know what nickel meant when they said nickel defense? Could that be possible? Well, it, it seems to me that it, it doesn't seem – like nickel seems like it's a very basic defensive term for football, right? Very dis, di, basic defensive formation. I mean, he, he played in the, in the wishbone in high school. I mean, he played at Southern Miss. I mean, he threw a ball the decent amount. I don't know how it was broken down to him or if he just didn't pay attention. I mean, this is a very – very blue collar guy, right? That they said his his diet was rice and beans and, and barley and hops when when he got to got to Green Bay. Mariucci was great, by the way, uh, in this. But I don't know. I mean, they said like he his coach told him, you know, they're, they're running the nickel defense, and he had to go ask Ty Detmer on the sideline as one of his backups. What do they mean by nickel? And, and to get to that level and be that good and not know what that means, that's that's pretty hard to believe. Yeah, that's hard. That's hard hard for me. But hey, Detmer repeated the story word for word. So yeah. Maybe, maybe there is some truth to it, but this is where we begin the, the legend of Favre. Favre and Holmgren kind of like a – Holmgren was, was, was hard on him. And I think yeah. was probably if we're going to single out, you know, one coach in the development of Brett Favre that sort of made him Brett Favre, it was harnessing that, that gunslinger mentality with like, okay, let's learn the finer points of being a quarterback. Right. I think, Favre, I think uh, Holmgren contributed to that. Mariucci, Andy Reid was there at that time. So he had a good coaching staff around him. Favre develops the reputation of playing every week. You know, I, I'm I I sort of soured on Brett Favre later in his career, which I'll get to. Yeah. But the one thing you can never take away from him was that he played every week. You can't you can't take that away from him. You know. And but at, what we don't know at this point, Ben, is that when he's pushing himself to play every week, he's also developing an issue with painkillers. Yeah. And I thought they did a very good job getting into this in in, in this part of the documentary where. He has a wife at this point, Deanna, which we'll get to here in a second. But she's still living in Mississippi while Brett's in Green Bay for the football season. And they well, they weren't technically married yet either, right? They weren't. Yeah. No, sorry, no, they weren't. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, which is interesting. Dating, like they were. They've they been were, dating since they were 14, though. Yeah, and had a child, and they like she spent most of the time with his family down in Mississippi, but they didn't live together. He was in Green Bay playing. Yeah, so when he's going through these uh, painkiller issues back in Green Bay, the family doesn't really know because no one's with him. Then Deanna moves up there, right? Right. And she starts to see, like, wow, he's never sleeping, and he's just getting up and going to practice, coming home, you know, popping these pills, not sleeping, going to practice. Like, it's not – she felt like it wasn't sustainable, you know? Right. She notices something's off with him, and that's when he enters into treatment for his painkillers. Yep, same time. In 96, he, he gets married as well. They actually go ahead and go to the altar and, and, and do that as well. Um so it was a big kind of turning point in his career in 96 because, you know, kind of when that happens, obviously we know kind of right after that, that's when Green Bay kind of went on its run. So it was kind of a turning point. But, yeah, I mean, it, you know, he was pretty close to becoming a um, a guy that, you know, ruined his entire career, it seemed like, off of this. Like, it it came to the point where he had to make that decision, and, and good thing he did because it could have easily gone the other way. Yeah, and good thing she was there to step in and, and had the kind of assertiveness to say, hey, you need to change. Yeah. Because it's it's tough to have that conversation with someone. Probably the fact that they knew each other since they were 14 years old probably helped in this situation. But, you know, she's a huge part of this. It can't be underscored. So then, obviously, now this season coming up here after he gets, you know, starts getting treatment for the painkiller issues is when he has probably, you know, not that he burst on the scene this year because he was already well-established, but he has a season now where he leads the Packers back to the Super Bowl um, versus the Patriots, playing in New Orleans, only an hour away from where he grew up. Mm-hmm. And you kind of mentioned burst on the scene. He well, he was MVP in '95. Do you remember? And I was trying to remember this as I was watching it. Do you remember this this press conference when he announced he was going to to rehab? I don't. Yeah, uh, that that one kind of surprised me because it seemed like a huge deal. I mean, the, the reigning MVP in the NFL was going off to rehab. Um, came back though. And uh, as you mentioned, won the Super Bowl in 96, close to his hometown, then lost the Super Bowl in 97 to Elway and the Broncos. Which, so. which we did here on the podcast, yep. by the way. That great, great episode game. on that Super Bowl. Yep. Great game. One of the more underrated Super Bowls when you go back and watch it. Yeah, absolutely. So he's in, you know, kind of a great point in his career. So, I mean, from this point forward, it's just kind of documenting his, his teammate, like how, how he was a great teammate. Um, 
they also spotlighted that game after his father died, uh, Big Irv, when Big Irv passed away in 2003. And uh, Brett yeah. Favre played a day later on Monday Night Football and had an incredible game against the Raiders. I mean, played maybe one of his better games of his career. And, um, you know, just kind of a special moment. Yeah, I mean, that's so I was – this is going to sound weird. My fantasy football league, been in for 20 years, we have a trade deadline. Okay. And every night, the night of the trade deadline, we go and watch Monday Night Football. So th- we, this is the game we went to watch. Okay. So yeah, good one. we went to go watch Raiders, Packers, this game with Brett Favre, and just a jaw-dropping performance by Favre in this game. But after seeing this documentary, there is no doubt he was going to play based on how he was raised. Right. Like, yeah. there was no question. Like, no question. Even as his mother was, was in this and – and said, you know, you know, he was his dad would have been most mad that he didn't play. Um, so this is one of those moments in Brett Favre's career. If you're doing like a five minute snapshot in his career, it's the one you always see. I think Javon Walker was his big receiver then. Remember Javon Walker? <laughs> Barely. <laughs> but um, some of the things they brought up in this Ben to sort of show that you know how much of an everyman Brett Favre is and how he endeared his se- himself to you know the fans in Green Bay, I thought were pretty interesting. I mean, did you? I, first of all, his appearance in Something About Mary when it happened was a big deal. Yeah, Do you right. remember that? Oh yeah, I love that movie. All right, he babysat Steve Mariucci's kids. Yeah, a starting quarterback in the NFL babysitting someone's kids. <laughs> his Keith Jackson imitation, yeah, I thought great. was great. He did, he did it multiple times. And that scene they showed here where he met Mr. Miyagi on the sidelines. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. I got a little scared for Brett because when, when he said, when he was on the sidelines, he goes, oh, that's Mr. Miyagi. Like, I was expecting him to just show, like, a random Asian guy. <laughs> but, but it was actually Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> he was talking about it on the field to, like, the opponents. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Yeah, Miyagi was, was just fun. on our sideline. I just talked to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's a big deal. He was that age, though, when, when he was young. Yeah. You know, Karate Kid was a popular movie, so I get it. I'd probably be the same way. <laughs> that's funny. I think well, Pat Morita has passed away, though. Yeah, what was he doing on the sideline? That's another question. But so you kind of document all that, but we get to the end of his career and we don't, they don't get into this a whole lot and it makes sense. I mean, this is not, you know, to tr- a spectacle and trying to, uh, you know, air any dirty laundry, but you know, obviously I think there was some controversy around Brett Favre's end of his career. And I think it soured a few folks on him, but you know, we saw the Aaron Rod- they didn't get they didn't get into the Aaron Rodgers draft as much, but we do kind of see it a little bit, how Aaron Rodgers got drafted and, you know, said he was a quarterback and Brett retires but wants to come back and play and wants his old job back. They didn't get into it a ton. But it's kind of very interesting kind of how that's playing out compared to what's happening with Aaron Rodgers now. But you had the old um, leave and uh, I want to prove myself with some other teams. And he had a cup of coffee with your Jets before going to the Vikings. So I want your thoughts on the Jets stint and then also just kind of, you know, what do you think about Brett? Because I know like that the way he finished out his career – if he would have gone out of Packard, he'd be he'd be probably loved by everybody. But I think he, you know, he, I think a few people just kind of have a little bit of a negative uh, perception of him, just the way that thing ended. Yeah. So as far as with the Jets, there's a reason why they, it was only like a literally a 10 second mention in this documentary that he went to the Jets. Number one, he was involved in a, in a scandal um, where he sent pictures to a team employee. Remember Jen Sturger, Ben? Oh yeah, yeah. All right. So she was very internet famous back in the day. Um, probably the, one of the first internet it girls I could remember. Um, but they didn't mention that, obviously. That was a big part of his tenure with the Jets. I think people remember that. But other than that, they got off to a really good start with Brett Favre, actually. They started off the season 8-3, and three, and then he got hurt. So he wasn't terrible at the Jets, but just you know, kind of marred by injury down the stretch. As far as how his career ended... Look, I didn't. I didn't like. I didn't mind what he did with the Jets. I mean, that's that is what it is. It was one season he got hurt towards the end, whatever. Um, I thought how he left Green Bay. I mean, I don't know. I didn't really agree w- with how everything went down. I didn't think it made him look great. When he went to the Vikings, I thought he sort of rejuvenated his career again in the eyes of the public. You know, yeah. that season in two thousand nine when they almost went to the Super Bowl. That's the game they lost to the Saints, right? Yeah, he threw a pick late, right? Yeah, kind of, across the field, across yeah. his body, you know what I mean? In New Orleans, ironically enough. Yeah. But, yeah. So, and, uh, you know. And, and the way you put it is like, you know, I, I, I didn't want to be one of those guys that was like, what if I would have stayed around a couple more years? How would things have gone, you know? And I think he, he didn't want to have any regrets. He walked off the field, and he, he said he didn't. He left kind of on his own terms, um, knew knew his time was over, and was was happy with that and, and content. And now he's he's back home and, and you know working and, and staying busy on the farm and, and the, the property and do shooting some commercials, some Wrangler jeans commercials and whatever else. Um, but 
you know, pretty emotional Hall of Fame ceremony. Obviously, off the cuff, no surprise that none of it was scripted, much like Favre's career. Um, but very interesting that he was like, I don't want to go to Canton. Like, he, he'd rather just have it in his backyard and have that ceremony. He didn't enjoy traveling at all. Yeah, they, they, his daughters are in this, and, and they mentioned, like, man, if my dad could have this in the backyard, he'd want to, you know? Like, he's going to go. He's going to have a good time. But, you know, he's very much a homebody now, and him and his wife make that clear throughout. Yeah. Well, the documentary is good. Uh, definitely learned a few things. They didn't get into, you know, it's not it's not a very detailed story on Favre's entire career, good and bad. Um, it definitely shines a good light on him, which, you know, it, it's fair uh, for the most part. But there were some things later on that I'm sure will be hashed out at some point uh, in a documentary. But for now, this was good. And um, overall, I thought it was solid. It didn't it wasn't like anything earth shattering, but definitely learn a little bit about Brett. Yeah, to be honest, this wasn't as good as some of the other football life episodes that we've uh, that we've done. But also, I think I went into it knowing a little bit more about Brett Favre than those other people. So to be fair, um, but definitely worth watching for sure. And Ben, before we wrap this up, the 1991 NFL draft, which Brett Favre was drafted in the second round, was low key pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, um, only one other Hall of Famer was a defensive back can you give a guess um drafted in the third round 91 third drafted in the third round by the cardinals pat tillman no aeneas williams oh, psh, no idea yeah you don't you don't know who aeneas williams is <clears throat> mike no i do not oh man he, he was you know he's a hall of, he's a hall of fame yeah defensive back but yes he went to southern university well, there you Brett go. Favre went to Southern Mississippi, the only two Hall of Famers from this draft. That's pretty crazy. Huh. Interesting enough. Well, we'll close it out on that note, Mike. Uh, enjoy this documentary. Please subscribe to the podcast. Follow us wherever it is you listen. Um, leave us, hit us the like button on, on YouTube. will help us out as well. And uh, find us online at distantreplaypodcast.com. <laughs>